Hello and welcome to the British Library. I'm Brett Walsh of the Cultural Events Department and it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's event, Kate Humble in conversation with Keggy Karu on her new book, Beastly. Uh, so before I hand over just a few points of housekeeping, this event accompanies our new exhibition, Animals, Art, Science and Sound. Uh, it opened last week and it's amazing uh, zoological treasure trove. So we hope you will um, book tickets and check it out. Uh, we've got a book stall at this event and both authors will be signing after the talk. So please do buy your copies. Um, we will also be taking uh, questions towards the end of the conversation. So please do have your questions ready. If you're watching online, you can uh, submit a question using the form just below the video. And if you're in the room, please do wait for the microphone so everybody can hear you. Uh, tonight's event is chaired by Kate Humble. Kate is a writer, smallholder, campaigner, and one of the UK's best known TV presenters. She's presented programs such as Animal Park, Spring Watch, Autumn Watch, uh, Lambing Live, and Escape to the Farm. Her books include Humble by Nature, Friend for Life, Thinking on My Feet, A Year of Living Simply, Home Cooked, and the forthcoming Where the Hearth Is. Thinking on My Feet was shortlisted for both the Wainwright Prize and the Edward Stanford Travel Memoir of the Year. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Kate and Keggy. Enjoy. Well, how lovely. Good evening, everyone. Um, uh, this is going to be a very informal event, even if you're over there online. Good evening. Um, we thought it would be more fun to have a bit of a conversation as opposed to uh, a sort of, you know, lecture. So feel free. I know Brett said um, you need to put your hand up and wait for microphones, just shout. We're in a small room. Um, we can all, I can repeat questions. Um, but if at some point you hear something, you want to ask something, um, this book, Beastly, is fascinating. There, you are going to hear so much tonight that you're going to want to talk about. So let's just join in rather than, as I say, is that all right? I think that's I, a I good mean, idea. I'm, I'm sort of taking over yeah, because, already. No, no, I think it's a good idea because Excellent. if you've got a if you've got a question immediately, it's immediate yes. rather than waiting for the end. And yeah, I think it's yeah. a good idea. So, yeah. ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who don't know, this is the magnificent Peggy Carew. Um, <laughs> and not only is she a brilliant writer, she was also a brilliant artist who then became a writer. I mean, that's just that's just showing off. Well, I don't know if I was a brilliant artist. I think it was because I probably wasn't a brilliant artist <laughs> that I became a writer. <laughs> Is that, but, but, you know, lots of people think, oh, I'd love to be an artist. Um, you were one. And lots of people think, I'd like to be a writer. And then you became one of those two. Mm -hmm. um, how did you make the transition? I always probably should have been a writer. Okay. I was better at being a writer. Yeah. It, came more easily to me but I wasn't allowed to be a writer because Why? well because I left school I didn't do anything I went traveling I didn't go to university I didn't do any of the things that one was supposed to do and I didn't think I would be allowed but I I find, I find with writing I can be very exact and the other thing about it is I've got possibly a lot to say and I want to say it for 20 quid yeah. Not, not for 6,000, which you need if you're going to spend eight months on a piece of work. Yeah, yeah. So it just suited me better. And then I was allowed to do it. And I mean, one of the things I was gifted with was my father, who, has this extra, who had this extraordinary story that I unraveled and the family that I came from, which and was a story in itself. So and that, that was the subject of your first book. That was that the was subject, Dadland. yeah. yeah. And, and, and Dadland, you know, first book, won the Costa biography of the year. I mean, that, again, is showing off. <laughs> well, it was lucky. It was lucky. I don't think I was, it was lucky. It There's was. No I wouldn't be, if awards. it hadn't, I wouldn't be sitting here now <laughs> with you, that's for sure. <laughs> um, you then wrote Quicksand Tales, which... I read when yeah. I was asked to do this event. I thought, well, I better find out about this woman. Oh my God. Right. I'm amazed you're alive. Yeah. I mean, it is, it's the most wonderful collection of stories um, uh, of, of your 
quite bonkers life, yeah. really. Well, it's the most terrible, terrible, it's the most terrible collection, really. I mean, all the awful things. But it was a reaction to everybody having a fabulous life. And I thought, well, I don't, that doesn't <laughs> happen to me. I'm constantly in a terrible state because something awful has happened. So I thought, I'll write about that Yeah. when awful things happen. But it's and one of those things that you, when you read it and you're going, oh my God, that happened to me yeah. as well. I mean, I was sacked from waitressing jobs. Yeah. Not as bad as your waitressing. No. <laughs> anyway, you, you know, you, do, you actually do need to buy all these books tonight. But what's really interesting about Beastly is that it is, you know, to me, not knowing you before we met last week, I went to her nature reserve. It's amazing. Um, it's, it's a, you know, it's a departure from what you've written before. So what I'm really interested in is why you have written the new history of animals and us when, you know, it feels like it's kind of come out of nowhere. Hmm. <clears throat> um, it's what I really, really care about. I really, really care about the natural world. I've always cared about it. I've always cared about watching animals and trying to understand what's going on. And I suppose, um, well, I was sent this photograph. I could explain. I could yeah, go do, into that because I know. So Keggy has put together a little. You, you've kind of. I've, you're giving us a little overview of the book. Aren't yeah, you? I've got. I've got um, ten minutes. I'm sorry. I'm going to read some of it because I wanted to get a lot in, and I'm just going to do it for ten minutes and show you about ten slides in ten minutes, um, which explains a bit how this book came out, came about. Um, and a little bit about what's in it. Yeah. And then we'll go from there and yeah. just, you know, go all over the place. Because there is a lot in this book. It's quite but, a thick um, book. There is a yeah. lot in it. This There's woman a lot. sat in his head for five years. For five years. <laughs> Yeah, but people ask me how it takes to write. It took a lifetime, you know. Yes. It really, it, it took a, a lifetime of watching rabbits when I was whenever, uh, however old I was, and just um, going off and, and thinking about creatures and tales of the riverbank. I don't know if anybody was old enough to ever watch that, but that that will set you off on loving animals. Yeah. You know, tales yeah. of the riverbank. Yeah. Well, show us this photograph because okay. okay. it is remarkable. This okay. this this so, photograph. Okay, so. This is the photograph that, that really was the genesis of this book, sent to me by um, my agent, Patrick Walsh, who's actually sitting here somewhere. You can guess which one he is. Um, centre stage in a dining room crowded with old clocks and brass lamps, a giant boar on her hind legs with both feet on, the ta on an oak table, um, a girl scattering crumbs from a loaf of bread, a candelabra precariously alight. The clock is at 12. Um, and it's like looking through a keyhole into a fairy story, um, outlandish yet somehow entirely natural. Um, and it cast a spell on me. Um, two years later, I was there with my face baffled against the pane of a deserted lodge in the middle of the Bielowatia forest in Poland, looking into the very room. Um, this was the home of Simona Kosak, the zoologist who studied the wild animals who lived in the forest around her. Um, and here was the lodestone for what would become beastly, um, this paradoxical and complicated 40,000-year story of animals and us. There she is, amazing woman. So there was a whole movement of worry about global warming, pollution, pandemics, biodiversity loss, soil degradation. We were in trouble and we were being told, yet at the same time we weren't listening. Wherever I looked, all roads led back to the same thing, our relationship with the planet's other inhabitants and the removal of their homes, their prospects and their food. Because as it turns out, animals run the ecosystems we depend on, gardening the green and the blue planet, replenishing the cycles of nutrients, maintaining the world that gives us our oxygen, our food, 
the clean water and, the, and takes the carbon dioxide away. And what's more, they do it for free. So animals are the maintenance crew and our relationship with them is the most important on the planet because with their presence, ecosystems function, and with their absence, they fall apart. So how come we didn't know this when we did? All our histories have one thing in common, a gaping, great, animal-shaped hole. And I wanted to unravel how on earth we got here. So, Beastly is a story of conflict and joy, misunderstanding and paradox. It cannot be linear, because it isn't. It's cultural as much as biological. We need to understand it to rectify it. And yet, for all the contradictions, no other animal so eagerly forms deep attachments across the species divide as we do. And these human envoys are numerous. <laughs> like, like the zoologist who became the surrogate mother to his gosling family. He's one of the, the early field naturalists who began to study animal behavior out of the lab and in relation to the animal's natural environment. Or like the big cat game hunter who became a conservationist and devoted his life and home to saving the big cats of India. The way we thought about animals informed how we treated them. We ordered the natural world into a hierarchy, a narrowing ladder that climbed, getting warmer and better, all the way up to man, women one rung below. We were not a branch of the evolutionary tree, we were the pinnacle. Thus, we became separated from the interrelated community of which we are part. We had dominion over the beasts with orders to subdue them and multiply ourselves. The church, as the Institute of Learning, shepherded our knowledge of animals for 2,000 years. And it's astonishing to think, in 350 BC, Aristotle described the octopus's sperm-presenting arm, thought fanciful until 19th century scientists discovered he was right. Yet, Edward Topsell's History of Four-Footed Beasts in 1607 divided animals into three categories, wild and tame, edible and inedible, <laughs> useful and useless. <laughs> So the then following centuries of plunder in the pursuit of knowledge or avarice. From our mammoth hunting days 30,000 years ago, humans began to change the face of the planet. By overhunting the mammoth, we put pay to a whole ecosystem, the fertile grasslands of the steppe that stretch from France to Alaska. Mammals with long pregnancies and few offspring could not replace themselves. Without the mammoth grazing and dispersing seeds and nutrients, grasslands became dominated by tundra vegetation, which, uneaten, became waterlogged and frozen, turning to acid, where peat, um, to acid peat where grasses struggled to grow. And this Victorian photograph of a Siberian mammoth has his tusks put in the wrong way round, um, because actually they were the other way. They went in for snow ploughing um, to open grazing areas which other animals like elk and horse and bison would follow along behind and benefit, which is a keystone species and why the whole ecosystem collapsed. So, oh. herbivores graze, fertilise dam, rivers, open glades, aerate the soil, transport seeds... Predators keep them in check from overgrazing. And this dynamic can solve many of our biggest challenges, fire risk, flood mitigation, soil health, insect collapse, carbon sequestration, and it's the best environmental fix out there with legs on. A recent study estimated that thriving populations of just nine key groups of animals Sharks, grey wolves, sea otters, musk oxen, wildebeest, ocean fish, American bison, African elephants and whales 
could facilitate the additional capture of 6.41 gigatons of carbon dioxide each year, which is almost the amount calculated to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. And I don't understand why we don't seem to realize this. Um, a sperm whale defecates 50 tons of iron each year in the upper layer of the ocean where phytoplankton capture as much CO2 as terrestrial plants, seeds clouds to reflect sunlight and provides half our oxygen. So phytoplankton feed plankton who feed krill, who feed little fish, who feed big fish. Whales increase marine life. The body of a great whale at the end of her life takes 33 tons of carbon uh, captured over a 70 year life to the ocean bed removing it from the atmosphere for centuries. So what is her ecological impact or the impact of her loss producing say 10 young who produce 10 young who produce 10 young? Before 19th century whaling, devastating populations, the effect would have been absolutely phenomenal. One reason why we need to protect recovering populations of great whales. So one of the scariest things in the world today is leaving the bedroom window open at night with a light on <laughs> because virtually nothing flies in anymore. Insects are indispensable in the food web as pollinators, decomposers, recyclers. Soil is a vast carbon sink containing billions of organisms doing a myriad of services, yet chemicals decimate invertebrate populations indiscriminately worldwide. And we cannot feed the planet without pollination or from degraded soil. Yet, at school, we were taught the names and fates of Henry VIII's six wives, not the animals that live in the bush outside our window or in the soil beneath our feet. And what more could we want? What alien, for instance, could change shape and colour, regenerate legs that can think for themselves, mimic the surroundings, fake seaweed, grow horns, pop up warts, glow in the dark, <laughs> pour themselves down a plug, play, dance, squirt you with ink, take off by jet propulsion and taste you all over with their embrace. What more do we want? <laughs> ecology is called a soft science, yet the root of the word ecology means home. Our home, this planet. The homemakers are sidelined, and aren't they always? These days, the whole of nature has become a last-minute add-on in the disembodied, faceless, colourless, lifeless catch-all, biodiversity. It sounds like a soap powder. Biodiversity, easy to rinse away. Why would you care about it? Yet so many of us do care. The photograph is a parable. The clocks tick, time is running out, the mighty boar and the girl break bread. Our home is shared, our sustenance is shared. Life supports life. Variety and abundance are the strengths. Animals could save us. The paradox is now only we can save them. So mm. there we go. <clears throat> That's just a little... That was beautifully, beautifully put um, and barely scrapes the surface of this remarkable book. Um, there's so much in here. I mean, I wasn't joking when you said you spent five years in a shed writing this book. And, crying. Um, crying. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not... What's, what, what I think is really interesting is... Um, you have found and tell the stories of some extraordinary people. I mean, to, to talk about Simona um, and her husband, Lech, who, who uh, lived in oh. the Polish forest. Um, and you tell a story about, uh, that we saw that photograph, yeah, with her and the deer. And it's sort of, it's now become fanciful, this idea that we could have a kind of proper 
any sort of proper relationship or, or, or coexistence with animals that isn't sort of somehow Disney-esque. And yet, you tell the story um, about her walking in the forest with the deer and the deer warning her. Can you tell that story? Because it's so, just remarkable. So she raised a young band of deer and mm. they lived in this extraordinary um, lodge right in the middle of the forest. I mean, it's eight kilometers up a track till you get to it. And they, she had raised this little group of, of deer and she would just walk in the forest with them. And one day she was walking along and they all stopped like this and, got, and they got very, very tall and they wouldn't go any further and they started to warn bark her. And um, she carried on and she thought, I'll go and investigate what's going on. And they really, really started freaking out and just barking and barking and stomping and stomping. And she went a little bit further and she um, saw some lynx prints and some lynx Feces, wow. and so she. It was the first time that she had really felt like she was part of the herd, yeah. and that she'd crossed that species divide, and that they were really communicating with her. That it was dangerous, and that she was part of their group. So that was a big thing for her at the time. I mean, they had, they lived in this. She, the photographer, became her partner. Mm -hmm. They hated each other for a long time, and. <laughs> Fought, like the, the lodge was divided into two different apartments. Um, and she, um, yeah, she was a zoologist and he was a photographer and they just collected over the time that they lived uh, in, I think there was, they were in this lodge for about 30 years, something about, uh, something along that time. And it was part hospital, part observatory, part home. Um, and she was studying the interrelations of the animals in the forest. And do you think she was so successful because she was properly immersed in their world rather than trying to kind of, in a more... I mean, you know, you can imagine a lot of scientists going, well, that's not scientific, you know. It's, oh, yeah. You, you know, you're yeah. not doing it in the lab, it's not controlled, no, it's no. not this, that and the other. But Well, they thought she was a witch because this was Poland in, right. you know, in, in, in the 60s, 70s. And... Uh, she had this huge great boar that used to follow her around and then they had the raven that used to fly and terrorize the, the local village and um you know it was she was a witch as far as they were concerned and and also she didn't like some of the ways that the zoological that the forestry were testing the, there was a, a pack of wolves and that they had these very very heavy uh, telemetric collars on them and sometimes they had problems with all sorts of poaching and traps the way they were te um, uh, uh, studying these animals yeah. she ha had a lot of conflict with them but she had very close observations and uh, you know she learned a lot more than they did yeah there was a, a another story i mean as i say the 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 richness of the material in this book is extraordinary I love the story of um, uh, Robert Payne, who's a marine biologist. And actually, if you do go to the exhibition, um, there is mention of him there. Um, but the experiment that he did, lobbing, um, I just have this picture of him, lobbing starfish out of rock pools mm. into the open ocean. What on earth was he doing? Well, the brilliance of, of him was finding the one, you know, how do you study ecosystems? Because there's just, it's, you know, how do you put a continent into, or a forest into a laboratory? And he came up with the one area that you could really, really study, sort of eight metre stretch in, in, on the intertidal zone of rock pools. And he decided, he thought, what would I, what would I do if I took out the top predator? Mm -hmm. And so the, the rock pools had about 15 different species, you know, shrimps and m m um, mussels and snails and, you know, about, about rock 15. Rock stuff. Rock pooly stuff. Yeah. And he thought, so for eight years, he came along every day or every, every few days and threw out, hurled out the starfish out of these rock pools. And the starfish being the top predator in those rock pools? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the starfish, so after a few years... From 15 species, it went down to eight species. Um, and that sounds completely counterintuitive yeah. because you're getting rid of the thing that's munching everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But what he was doing 
was getting rid of the thing that was munching the th that was munching everything, which was the mussels. So when without the mussel predator, the mussel just took over. Huh. So the mu so all, there was no space for anything else. So that so it was just this wonderful um, example of trophic. It's called trophic cascade. It's like it's the nutrient cycle just goes. It just falls apart because you haven't got the balance anymore. Um, so um, the, the whole thing was just muscles in uh, these particular. And that and 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 that is that's because because you know we live in a country where we have very successfully got rid of all yeah. our top line predators. Yeah. And big error. Yeah, big era. But but you know, there's a lot of discussion. Um, there's been a lot of press about it. A lot of kind of very high profile people talking about uh, bringing back wolves or bringing back lynx, bringing back bears. You know, do you think our country is really ready for that? Sadly, it's not ready for it. Otherwise, we'd be doing it. You know, I mean, lynx is a no brainer. It's just a no brainer. You know, that they they don't. They don't eat sheep very often, probably hard, you know, uh, probably not. You know, I mean, they, 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 they live in the forests. They're very, very good at um, deer, catching deer. We desperately need a, a deer, we some do. deer They're hunters. De I've just planted yeah. 600 trees, yeah. and most of them have yeah. already been eaten. And it's not that they will eat the deer, necessarily. They will eat some deer. It's yeah. the landscape of fear that's so important. Yeah. It's the landscape of fear that they create, so the deer don't just go, oh, we can just stay here because we can just eat the whole valley out. But yeah. well, the moment you have a wolf or a deer or a predator, they just keep moving, and, and that's what creates these dynamic... Um, these dynamic uh, habitats is when you've got the whole complement of everybody in there. And it's the healthy habitat, isn't it? Because yeah. there's the other story that, uh, again, that Robert Payne, uh, his, his sort of experiment with the starfish mm. sort of uncovered of the importance of these, as you say, these sort of yes. A-list, these top-line so predators. Top down. Yeah. Um, is uh, the the otter, yeah, um, and the importance of sea otters yeah. that, of course, we think of as just really sweet furry things that lie on their backs and juggle stones and look nice on camera, yeah. um, but they actually play a really important role in one of the key environments, which is kelp yeah. forest. Yeah, absolutely. He went to Amchitka, Amchitka Island. Mm -hmm. uh, they were doing a whole lot of nuclear testing, and they were they, they sent a wildlife guy out to see, you know, to study. Uh, what would happen to the animals when they did all this nuclear testing. Anyway, there was a guy called James Estes there, and mm -hmm. he was doing that study. And he went, oh, there's this remnant uh, population of sea otters, and um, they've survived because there's all this great kelp. They'd survived because they were just because there was a remnant. They hadn't been um, decimated by they the fur trade. They had been nuked. <laughs> but but it but um, it was Robert Payne that went over and he said, think of it the other way around. You don't have a hot... It's not that you have a healthy population of sea otters because you have the kelp. You have a healthy, you have a healthy kelp forest because you have the sea otters. Yeah. Because the sea otters eat the urchins and the urchins eat the kelp. So when you wipe out the sea otters, you suddenly got these things called urchin barons. Just, uh, 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 they just eat all the kelp and there's nothing but urchins. And so somebody said, well, what happens to the urchins? They are able to live an awful long time without eating, weirdly. And they just wander off somewhere else and eat something else. But it's out of balance. You know, there's just hundreds and hundreds of thousands of these urchins that will, if you don't have sea otters. So, and there is this lovely story that you tell. So talking about balance, because we think we're the clever ones. We think we're, you know, we've got life sorted out and we know how everything works. But it turns out that actually there's a moth mite that knows about balance infinitely better than we yes, do. We do. And I, when I read that story, I was like, I literally can't believe it. No. You've got to tell it. Yeah, I mean, really, we could, we could learn a few lessons from this mite. It's a mite that lives in a moth's, a noctuid moth's ear. Um, yeah. <laughs> and um, it's called Drycocles, dry, I think. But a moth expert would, would, would correct me on that um, pronunciation. Anyway... It inhabits the ear, and it makes the moth ear deaf by um, penetrating the tympanic um, membrane. But 
it will never migrate to the other ear. So it will only ever occupy one ear because it won't do for a moth to be completely deaf because a, a moth that's deaf won't be able to pick up echolocation from bats and it's going to get preyed on by bats and that's not going to be great for the moth parasite either if, the, if their host is preyed upon. So, um, but the, what it does, if there's any, str any stray mites that go off, you know, wayfaring to the other ear, they send scouts out and bring them back. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how genius is that? And that is a tiny little mite that you would just completely overlook. Yeah, they bring them back. <laughs> um, which brings us on to, uh, I know, something that um, features in the book features largely in your life because it's something that you abhor and it's possibly the most toxic relationship that humans have formed with animals and it's that of factory farming. Um, now, I live in a farming community and I have a farm, um, mercifully not a factory farm. And uh, some of the descriptions that you give in the book were horrifying to me. Um, why, why have we got to the stage where we are having to treat animals in a way that is beyond inhumane, mm. just for the sake of food. You know, there are things in this book that are hard, but you can't write a book about our relationship with animals without with, uh, avoiding them. Mm. So I wasn't going to avoid, you know, I wanted to balance it with the, this extraordinary, the, the extraordinary wonder of, of, of the animal world. But the thing about uh, industrial farming is, I mean, um, Yuval Noah Harari, who wrote Sapiens thought it was the worst crime that humans have ever, in, 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 and he's an Israeli historian, he thinks that's the, it, the, our, our worst crime is uh, how we treat industrial livestock. And when you start reading about it, the book to read is a book called Eating Animals by Jonathan Safran Foer, and it is an absolute page turner. I thought, I'm not reading that book. Why, how could you possibly write a book called Eating Animals? But it's a brilliantly written book, and I, I suppose it was a real great, it was a great teacher to me of how you can deal with bad stuff, you mm -hmm. know, because it's, it's fascinating. It, it's profit, it's lobbying, it's we don't want to know. If, if you talk to people about it, which I did, of course, when I was researching this book, you know, actually hands come up in front of the face because we just don't want to know. And that's how, and that's how it works. That's how we, um, we don't want to know. And so we don't know. Is it we um, don't want to know or we don't want to pay? I mean, let's, let's I'm, I'm going to make a yeah. horrible generalisation now, so forgive me, um, uh, and I may be very wrong, but I suspect most of the people in this room are here because they're interested in the natural world, they're interested in your book, and, uh, and, and may be very conscious of choosing what they eat and careful of what they eat. We're in the midst of a, co a cost of living crisis. Um, people have to eat. Um, is factory farming, that mass production of food in a way that is done as cheaply as possible, really the only way that people can, who are on lower incomes, who are struggling in all other areas of their lives, they need to eat. So. Can you really point the finger at factory farming and say this shouldn't happen? I mean, you know, I'm not pretending I have answers for everything. You know, I don't have answers. There's a hell of a lot of problems in that book, you know, that we don't have answers for. But I don't think that we need to go down that road. I don't think... I think the cruelty of... I mean, I'm talking industrial farming. I'm not talking of... There are some very, very good farmers out there. Um, and... For me, the bottom line is if we have, if we give, if we have animals, that they must have a life that's worth living. Mm. That's the bottom line for me. And there are other things to eat. And it can, when, when we say it's a cheap way of eating, it's actually a very expensive way of eating because the 
costs are what we call externalities, and it's going to cost. We pay we pay huge prices for all the pollution and all the, the all the health problems and all the. Uh, um, the uh, injections and all the antibiotics that, that we feed into these animals and all the wrong food. And then we grow food in, and feed them stuff that they're not supposed to eat in the first place. They don't have, I mean, I call one chapter something about it's a, bird, it's a cow, not a cow, it's, not, it's a cow, not a bird. They don't have gizzards. Yeah. Um, but yet we feed them grain and stuff that they're not supposed to eat. And if you go through, a, if you go through some of these factory farms, uh, you can tell by just the shit everywhere. It's all it's unnaturally all the um, diarrhea shit flowing into the sea. It's that's an expensive way to eat. So for me, I don't necessarily have the answers, but I can see definitely the problems of that's going to be very expensive for our grandchildren to deal so with. So it's a false economy. It is, is what you're saying. It's an incredibly false economy, and it's also it doesn't make you well eating yeah. food like that. I mean, you don't want to eat some of the stuff that. I've read about, um, and you know, it's full of drugs. It's full of all sorts of stuff. I mean, just, but it's also it's the cruelty. There's terrible, terrible cruelty, and I actually don't think many human beings would eat it if they had to see what the animal went through, and understood what the animal went through. But you're not vegan. I'm not. No. And so, how do you square that? So, well, I don't, you know, so many things in my life I don't square, as you read Quicksand Days. <laughs> but we spend less money on meat than we ever, than we ever did. You, Jonathan, and I. Right. We, we spend less money on meat than we ever did. But what we eat, it's venison that's organic and being shot by a marksman. Yeah. Um, it's. Uh, uh, I've got a friend who has a farm in Sussex, and we get her. I know that the animals have a good life. So provenance is really so important. It's really important to us. Yeah, it's really important. I'm, this is not. I'm not. I don't want no, to no, lecture no. or tell people what to do. I just with this book, I want to just tell it how it is. In and you know, it is a small part of the book, but it is a really important part. How we eat. You know. I think. I think you know one of the things, and and you know, it's something that that. I've had experience of as well. You know, our parents, or perhaps more our, our grandparents' generation, would never have expected to eat meat three times a day yeah. from three separate animals. Whereas now that seems to be, you know, well, we'll have a bacon sandwich mm. for breakfast and a chicken sandwich for dinner and a, a lunch and a steak for dinner or whatever, you know. And, um, and, and not want to pay the real price yeah. for it. I mean, the extraordinary thing that I found by you know, my association with farming is that you think if somebody gives you business advice, set up a business that provides something that everybody needs. And you think, well, farmers should all be <laughs> multi-squillionaires. Mm. Um, and no one is. And a lot of that is politics, isn't it? It's governments thinking, well, if, if, if we make sure food is cheap, we're going to be popular. Mm. And that seems to me... So we're, really, we're dealing with a political problem here. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, there's um, I'm just slightly sidelining another thing which is to do with farming. It's just that we've just been given, in this country, permission to use neo neonicotinoids. Um, um, do, do all of you know what those are? There's a horrible, horrible chemical. So it's a, it's a chemical that's used for, basically, um, uh, for crop. Sprayed on crops, and um, and it, this it, is, it 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 completely destroys insects' ability. Their nervous to, system. Yeah, it, it's a systemic thing. You coat a seed, and the whole plant is riddled with it. I mean, so that any insect landing, and it attacks their nervous system. So the extraordinary thing is that this government there was there was a big lobby to stop uh, using neonicotinoids. neonicotinoids and can't say that when you've had a glass of red wine, it turns out. Um, and uh, this government has uh, just allowed people to use it again. Um, what that does is, um, as Keggy says, it, it destroys the uh, nervous system of some of our key insects, pollinators. If we don't have pollinators, we it's don't soluble, have food. so it goes into the watercourse, and it's um, long-lasting. Is residual, and but 
the thing about it, you can't use it for everything, but you can use it on sugar beet. Yeah. Now, and sugar beet, been... and, the, and the thing about that for me is, well, that's great because sugar beet goes into making Mars bars and Coca-Cola. So that, you know, that's where our priorities lie. We, you know, it's just... It's, they're not the most healthy crop in the world, and it's just everything is a bit broken. So, but there are people doing extraordinary things. Yes. Um, uh, and again, going back to some of your amazing people, I want to marry Gabe Brown. Oh, do you? Yes, <laughs> you, I do. You wouldn't if you saw. <laughs> <laughs> I'm he's too old. old. He's too old. Don't for you. prick my bubble. No. Um, but tell us about this amazing. He is farmer. amazing. Well, he. <laughs> Gabe Brown was a American guy whose closest thing to nature was mowing the lawns, you know, for um, his pocket money. And he didn't know anything. He lived in a sort of town. I think it was Idaho. It's in North was Dakota. It, uh, no, North yeah. Dakota, sorry. North sort of Dakota. prairie land. Prairie land. And he married the um, farmer's daughter. And then he started, and then he was helping on the farm. And, you know, it's an area where the temperature goes from plus 40 to minus 40. It's really, really hard. And, um, you know, it's the old prairie country where they lose half their, um, their soil, you know, their dirt. And so he started, he went off to the library and he read up about Lewis and Clark, the first um, uh, explorers that went through there and their descriptions of this country before, it's, before it was farmed and how incredibly fertile it was. And he thought, well, I think we need to go back to that. We need to go back to how, um, how that, those, those big uh, ungulates were grazing and moving on and fertilizing the country, very much like the mammoths. Yeah, uh, that I was so this would have been bison, step. presumably. Yeah, bison and or and, and, and deer and and, and, and and all those um, creatures. And he just went back and he um, tr he tried a few things, got the wrong type, a bit like you told me, got the wrong type of um, uh, cows, and then got some different cows, and just ended up finding a way of farming this particular landscape without inputs, without chemicals, without the, the animals. He'd move them around quickly. Um, they all had a life outside, he had chickens, and it's sort of slightly old McDonald's farm, but on, you know, really making a profit. Yeah. And um, it was just, a, you know, it was farming, instead of just going horizontal, it was going vertical. It was, the, his soil was something just it went from being the sort of dusty stuff that couldn't really hold much water to being incredible. I mean, the, the figures are in the book how much water he, you know, he could hold after it. And, um, yeah, it, it really worked for him. And it's really interesting because lots of, you know, there's, there's been lots of call for let's not have any livestock on the land, you know, overstocking, things like having too mm. many sheep or too many cattle, um, you know, an excess of methane, which we don't mm. need, and... And, uh, and, and, you know, it's destroying the land. But actually, as you say, you know, there are big areas of our planet that have evolved to work with mm. big grazing animals. Yeah, yeah. And so we need them. Yeah. I mean, it's a niche, you know, you don't want them everywhere, you know, and you don't want everything is, again, it's out, it, it, again, it's when they function well, it's brilliant. You know, yeah. they create these brilliant, brilliant ecosystems and you get fantastic bird life and you get fantastic, you know, if you get the beavers in and you get these great water systems and, you know, you get clean soil. And actually, if you, if you do the sums, it's cheaper yes. than doing what we've been doing, yeah. but we've been subsidising. It's very, very hard to work it. You know, it's very, very hard to backtrack, and you've got huge, great lobby. You know, the lobby well, it, groups. I mean, you've got the chemical companies. We're and seeing it with our rivers now. Yeah. You know, with intensive poultry where you farming live, yeah. where we live. Yeah, um, uh, and I think that the the extraordinary thing again. I mean, it's 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 one of the things I think that anyone who spends any time with any sort of animal, whether it's your dog or cat at home or any time with wildlife, animals are not dim. They're not stupid. Um, but there is a story, a lot of, there's, there's that sort of slight thing with vegetarians. I'm sorry if any, I, I eat everything. So, you know, judge me if you like. I'm not judging anyone here, but um, there's that slight thing with vegetarians, but I eat fish because fish are, 
perhaps a little bit dim. Mm. And then I read your astonishing story about cichlids. Yeah. And anyone who is a vegetarian that eats fish, you might want to cancel your next order with your fishmonger when you hear this story. Yeah. Just, I, I, I will, I'll tell this story as best I can remember it. Um, I'm just going to go track back on the thing about eating animals. And it's just, I'm not trying to have an answer for, you know, for vegetarians or for... I just think we need to know about what, what goes on. That's, that's the thing. And I'm not an expert on farming. And I'm, I've always been a generalist. Mm. And I'm just trying to really find out what's going on and just give that information. But as you say, it's, it's giving people an informed choice. Yeah, that's and that's what this book does, is that you, you tell us things that you know, we, we may never have known. And also what it does is help us navigate choices that we want to make. I don't think there is probably anyone in this room, anyone online, or indeed anyone out there, really... Mm. Actually, I might back <laughs> on that. But anyway, I'm, I'm going to be... Certainly I'm not be watching this. Here. I'm going to be optimistic. But, I, you know, you hope that actually, you know, most people do want to have... Mm. Uh, you know, if not a functioning relationship with the other species with whom we share the planet, you would hope that they would want a healthy home. And, and a healthy home means having a functional relationship yeah. with the other species with which we share the planet. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. I think being able to be informed in a way that is, as you say, you know, some of this book is really hard hitting. Some of it is quite hard to read. And some of it is just incredibly uplifting, which brings me neatly back okay, to back the cichlid story. Because okay. th so, it's just the mo I couldn't yeah. believe it when I read it. It's um, Conrad Lorenz, who was this, well, he was the guy with the geese, who just, he's famous for imprinting his, his um, work on uh, being a goose mother by talking to the eggs and um, then the eggs cheep cheep back, in, back to him while they're actually still in the, uh, in the egg. And the moment they see the first thing, they imprint on, and it happened to be Conrad, and so he was their mum for a while. And it was, it was really interesting work. But um, he lived. He was an Austrian zoologist, and in, he just before the Second World War, he he lived. His house was in, on the River Danube, and he lived with all the animals. Uh, jackdaws in the roof and everything was free. The only thing that was slightly constricted was his aquarium. It was a very big aquarium, but he got himself a couple of um, uh, cichlid, tropical West African cichlid fish, and they are renowned for their parenting skills. And so he was delighted that he got this, this, this pair and the male was all in his sort of flashy pair, father colours, and the uh, female... Uh, fish cleaned the stone, laid the eggs. The both parents were fanning the eggs. The fry hatched, and um, the little fry they sink to the bottom by contracting their slim, sw swim bladders, and then they um, then they can swim, and then they contract and they go to the nest. So they actually do stay in the nest when they're small. And they were swimming around during the day, and the father. Um, bringing them back at the nest at night would sometimes inhale them. Well, he would inhale them and then blow them into the nest and the mother would be in the, in the nest with her young. And one day, Conrad came home late and hadn't fed them. And the mother was in the nest with her fry. The father was swimming about. And Conrad threw in a chopped up worm. And so the father, the mother stayed in the nest. The father just just went, oh, yes, I'm hungry, and I grabbed the, grabs the, the, the worm and started chewing. And then one of his errant young swam past, so he automatically swallowed it because that's, what he was, that's his job, to swallow his, his babies, to put them into the nest at that time. And then he stopped this tropical fish <laughs> because he had the chopped-up worm in one cheek <laughs> and his baby in the other cheek and he stopped and Conrad Lorenz just was riveted and it was just the most exciting thing he's ever seen in his zoological life because at that moment he saw a fish make a decision 
the fish stopped, spat out both the worm and the baby. The worm, I mean, the baby went to the bottom, contracted its swim bladder. <laughs> the, the fish grabbed the, the worm, the, the spat out worm, chewed that up, swallowed it, then picked up the baby and then took him back to the nest. <laughs> that was a decision. And it was thinking it through from a, a tropical sickly I, I, fish. I just, I love that I story. believe it, yeah. I'm never going to eat fish and chips again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It's it, one of the other hard things uh, that you deal with in this book is the very contentious subject of hunting. Um, and of course, you know, human beings have hunted since we evolved. We, are, we were hunter-gatherers. Um, uh, until we started farming about 10 to 12,000 years ago. Um, you tell a story about your father eating a fly that somebody swatted. Why did he do that? Um, well, he was always doing... His lessons were always a bit like this. And um, I think somebody casually swatted a fly. Yeah. And so he ate it with a big flourish. And he ate the fly. And his lesson was just very, very simple. If you kill it, you must eat it. Hmm. And I remember it very well. I do, I've got family here, I'm sure. We all, we all have dad's lessons, were very many, but they were always very, very good. It was, um, it, and he stuck by it. He would never, he was a guerrilla agent in the war and had to do some pretty, you know, major stuff. But the day that he was given a sheep, and he was chucked out of a helicopter or something with a sheep in training in Scotland. Not a helicopter, sorry, they didn't exist then. But he was chucked out into the wilds with a sheep and a knife. And he just didn't kill the sheep because he didn't need to kill the sheep. Everybody else killed their sheep, <laughs> came home with a nice sheepskin rug. But he just didn't. Because he didn't need didn't to. Didn't need to. He, so yeah, let's... didn't need to at that point. That brings he us would on have done if he'd, if, he'd yeah. been, if he'd needed to. So that brings us on to the subject of trophy hunting. Um, is that a need or not? Because there's a, an argument that trophy hunting, you know, people going and paying vast sums, tens of thousands of pounds to shoot lion or leopard or elephant, um, is ploughed back into conservation. And actually, you know, if it's controlled and if it's, you know, done well, uh, that somehow that is, it's, it's a, a palatable solution um, that scratches an urge that some people have to shoot things. Mm. Discuss, Keggy Carew. <laughs> well, I've got... I, I had a long, long, long talk with Will Travers from Born, Born Free, and um, he has, for 40 years, been through the trophy hunting argument, mm -hmm. every which way. And the problem is with that is, yes, you can pay $50,000 and you can go and shoot a rhino, and that's a lot of money. But that money goes back into the industry, and a little bit goes into the local community but not much, it goes back into the, into the industry. And in the whole of the African continent, trophy hunting makes about $200 million, which is a lot of money. It's a lot of money. In Kenya, they don't trophy hunt, mm -hmm. and they make two billion, two billion American dollars. And that's from that's people from coming to see... Coming to see, pe coming to see animals. The other problem is, the moment you legalise it, which they've, you know, they've done, and the moment you do that, you, can, you create loopholes for illegal, move, mm. illegal uh, operations. So you've got, you know, if you can shoot 30 elephants or something, or a, a few rhino horns, then you've got, suddenly you've got, well, is this a legally shot ivory? Or, and then suddenly the stigma of ivory isn't so bad as it was because it could be. So there's all sorts of other psychological sort of get outs of... Um, well, it, it muddies the waters, doesn't it? I mean, I spoke, because I remember thinking, and again, you write about uh, Kenyatta, President Kenyatta, 
of Kenya setting fire to their ivory mm. tower, yeah. literally, yeah. ivory tower. Um, and I remember hearing about that at the time mm. and wondering, you know, being so conflicted and thinking, you know, but that ivory is there, the elephants are dead, if you sell it and put the money into the right thing, you know, there's a lot of money there. Um, would it drop the bottom out of the illegal ivory market? Um, it, you know, it was, it, was, it was one of those things that there seemed to be, it, it didn't seem to be obviously the right thing to do to set fire to that. And yet that is what he mm. did. Such a courageous thing to do. Such a courageous thing to do. And when yeah. I read it in your book, I suddenly thought, actually, what was I conflicted about? Because mm. I hadn't really, I think, at the time appreciated exactly, as you say, human beings have this extraordinary way of justifying yeah. things that are not justifiable. No, and, and he said uh, ivory belongs to, the, uh, to African elephants and tourism belongs to Africans. Mm. And, and I thought that was exactly right. Yeah. Um, and I think that the moment that ivory goes back into the market, you've got real, real problems. And apparently, according to Will Travers, you've got poaching problems because if you've got all this can hunting going on. And you've got, you know, there are 20,000 lions in, this, in, in, in the wild, and there's many more in farms being bred for trophy hunting. And then you can pay a bit extra and you can cuddle the cubs. It's not okay. It's just that, like it's just well, it's not like, okay. It's, again, it's that the very basis of this book that is such a skewed relationship. Yeah. yeah. With with wildlife. Yeah, and and it's it's just not very good for you killing a big thing, and cuddling it. It's just not very good for you. No. You know, and I mean, and it, it, th there it, are there are um, studies in America that you know just before the hunting season comes up, there's you know real violent problems at, in, in at home with some of the hunters. I mean, you know, you go there. It's it's not a place I really want to go, but um, it's not good for you to no. be doing that. No. And the, it just seemed to me that all the all the trophy hunters that I did watch, and I did watch quite a lot of them, they all seem to be have quite serious psychological problems. You know, cuddling, you know, this beautiful thing that they profess to love, but they profess to love it so much they had to kill it first. But it is, it's a, it's a real, I mean, because you talk about Alfred Wallace, who I'm sure many of you um, have yeah. heard of. He was the man who wanted to be Darwin, but Darwin kind of was richer and more influential than he was, so he sort of got there first. But, you know, Alfred Wallace was an extraordinary naturalist, yeah. um, uh, discovered some things that are as important for our knowledge now as they were then. Um, if you go to the Natural History Museum, you'll see a lot of the things that he collected. He was a prolific co collector, mm -hmm. even though his, he spent... How many years? Was it six years in the Amazon collecting? And then he lost the whole bloody lot because his boat caught fire yeah. on the way no, home. No, boat sank. Uh, and <laughs> boat sank. sank. Um, yeah. but, but he was very conflicted by that because, you know, he was a naturalist. He loved the natural world. And yet he shot all sorts of things. Yeah. I mean, that terrible story about the orangutan baby yeah. that you told. Sorry about that. Yeah. Yes. That, that slightly haunted me. Yes, yeah, right? sorry about that. Um, <laughs> But it, I mean, it was a different time. I mean, it, in and in con, I, to put it in context, you know, uh, I think there was still a market for um, Aboriginal uh, yeah. skeletons yeah. from Australia. So, you know, it, we're different people. We are different people than we than his era. But I mean, he got what, what was so interesting about Wallace is that in, when he was in Indonesia looking at the paradise birds, which, you know, there's a, films of them in this exhibition here, and they are just phenomenal, just like unbelievable. And so he was in this sort of dark, gloomy, uh, tropical rainforest, and then these extraordinary birds doing this extraordinary things. And he was thinking, how can those beauty be wasted <laughs> without intelligent without the, you know, it being viewed by intelligent creatures like ourselves. And this has been going on for hundreds of years without anybody to appreciate it. How can that possibly be? 
And at the same time, his paradox was that he understood exactly that we were not, that they didn't need us. The paradise birds had these extraordinarily complex interrelations with all the bugs and all the, everything else that, that was in the forest was interconnected. And he really understood that. Yeah. Um, but he liked hunting and he wanted one more and he wanted that butterfly and it, oh God, and he got it in his hands and it was struggling and it was, he just, you know, I mean, we're just, we are, we're animals too. Yeah. And, you know, we're, yeah. we're hunters too. We were hunters yeah. and we, you know, it's, I really don't want to judge, but I do judge, if you see what I mean. I kind of make judgments about, okay, so I don't think trophy hunting well, is, is okay th- now. It's just not okay now. We no. don't have enough animals. And, and it is, you know, your story, uh, you may remember the, the slide at the beginning. I don't know whether you actually took it in, um, but maybe, maybe you can find it again. The screen's gone dead. But the, the, so of um, Arjun Singh. Uh, but you may remember that there was a picture of a man in a canoe with a leopard standing in the canoe holding its cup, which is, I mean... That is just a bonkers image. Um, tell the story, because it's the... I mean, he but was a hunter, He this was man. a he, big game hunter, yeah. uh, from princely stock, you know. Um, and he was, driving in the, he was driving through the forest one night, and he caught a leopard in the headlights of the car. And, of course, he had guns. They all had guns. He jumped out and shot it and killed it. And it just... He suddenly realised, he just suddenly realised, he just felt completely just repulsed by it. He had a moment of epiphany and he just spent the rest of his life saving big cats um, of of India. And that, (laughs) as you can see, (laughs) and this particular story was he had um, raised this leopard and successfully released her back into the wild. She was an orphan, I think, Mm -hmm. a cub. And she had had two cubs and the monsoon had come in and the river where she lived on the other side, he lived in this place called Tiger Haven, which was in the middle of the Dudva forest. And um, the monsoon rains came up and she, uh, there was a point where it was all getting a bit hectic and she um, crossed the river before it was, I think, before it was too swollen and put each cub into, his, into the, um, the lodge where he lived, into the bedroom. He was, you know, she, she, she was uh, familiar with him, but she'd brought her cubs back to, keep, to get and them safe. And that's extraordinary. Yeah. Because even an animal that has had, as you say, contact with a human being, as soon as they yeah. become a mum... No, he couldn't believe they... it. He was very, very surprised. But she was there for two weeks or something. until, And when the flood waters went down... She took her cubs one by one back to the to the river, and when she got there, the river was still quite high. And so, what she did is she just walked over with the cub in her mouth and got into the canoe and just waited for him. And he um, taxi taxi exactly <laughs> got her across. She hopped out and took the cub back into the jungle. Didn't she didn't know where they were? Yeah because they were hidden. And then he waited and waited and waited, and about half an hour later she came back and um, he brought her back and she went and got the other cub and he ferried her across. Um, an extraordinary story. It's an there extra- she is, you know, no collars. I mean, that's the other thing I love about it. It's no tracking collar. No, nothing, and no, yeah. You know, because there's so many gizmos on animals these days. I know, I, know. It's just I, like, know. You just, I don't but, want to see an animal with a great big collar on it, you know. But there are, I mean, you have some really lovely stories. I've just seen that we've had a, um, a question in uh, from one of the viewers online, hello viewer online, um, who says lots of people, especially young people, experience eco-anxiety. Um, do you have any advice? And um, this is a very That's real a really thing. Good question. And it's a really good question. Yeah. But one thing before we get to sort of answering that specifically, I think one thing that really I found very uplifting about this book, it is a very... It's a very balanced book. It's like a moth mite of a book. Um, yeah. Is that uh, alongside the quite difficult reading um, are these incredibly uplifting stories of human beings that are 
have done and are doing amazing things. And I hope whoever sent in that question may feel a little less anxious when you hear that there are people doing amazing things. Mm. Len Howard, that oh, woman, yeah. tell us about her. Um, Len Howard, and we will get back to that question. We because will, we, yeah. Because that is an important question, and, and it, there are so many people that are doing wonderful things, and it is, there was a thing with Aldo Leopold, who... Um, the American writer. The American writer in the 30s felt like he lived in a world of wounds and he was very lonely, you know. For the, for, and actually, that is one of the things at the moment. We don't have to be alone with, with this. There's a lot of people out there. But um, Len Howard, that was she, she was a, um, she, I think she was a viola player and a concert, a concert player. And she just went and lived in the country in Sussex and decided that instead of... Uh, looking out of the box into animals and, you know, behind, in a hide, watching them in their natural environment or, you know, having them in the lab. She would just let bring them into the house and encourage them to live in, in the house with her. So her whole, all her garden birds, her tits, her wrens, her great tits, the, they all, she had all the windows open, all the nest boxes were in the house. Um, for, I think, from 19... It was wartime to about 1973, so I think 33 years she lived in Bird Cottage um, with all these birds. I found her first in, in it was a, what's that, what was that green magazine, um, The Countryman. Oh, yeah. And it was a little, yeah. it was a 1957 version. I bought it from a, an antique market, and the story of Len Howard is in there with all these photographs of these just blue tits all over her and um it was, it was just that yeah. i just had this lovely they called vision. her an amateur naturalist and but she wrote she wrote two brilliant books oh, one was um oh anyway she wrote two brilliant books but it look was all at, about communication and how they communicated and she she wrote down all their biographies and how you know all the different movements the gaping the the the, the tails going up the funny tail of this and it, you just think they the communications are very very subtle and it's a bit like you and I can tell just by tiniest movements if somebody, if you're a bit upset or said something slightly wrong or just by tiny, tiny things. Well, they've got the same kind of tiny, tiny things that communicate to each other. And it was, um, she had one bird that she could literally, a, a blue tit, want to eat the butter. And if she said no... <laughs> Or if she said no and not, didn't really mean it, it would try. And if she said absolutely not, it would just fly off. It yeah. would absolutely no. There was that much communication. Yeah, yeah, that, you know. yeah. And the, the, the other lovely um, story was the um, Croatian janitor with oh, the yeah. stork. I mean, that was a Patrick's favourite story. <laughs> oh, well, I, I, I'm going to compete yeah. with you for it. Yeah. It, was, it was a lovely story. Um, well, it was a janitor in Croatia who in 1993, possibly, um, ca came across a wounded stork, migration hunting, again, hunters, and um, brought, it, brought the stork home and it was a female stork and decided that she, he would feed it, feed her. I'm very careful in this book to try and make sure that animals are he's or she's or uh, if, if it's very obvious what they are. Um, and he built her a nest around the chimney. And for 10 years, he called her Milena, put Milena up in the nest during the summer, brought her back down in the, in the winter. For the, uh, into the garage where it was warmer because she couldn't fly, because she couldn't migrate back to South Africa. Um, and he worried about her stork loneliness. So he, but he, he loved her, and they went off fishing together, and they went into the car, of, in the car together. And then one year, to, after 10 years, a male stork was flying over um, this village in Croatia and came down... And Stefan was the name of the janitor. He could see them. They put their necks back and they were started courting. And that year, um, the male stork called Klepertan stayed and they raised three chicks. And Klepertan came back every year for the almost next 20 years. 
So he, so Stefan had had Milena for 10 years. Klebertan had come every year for 20 years. And in the end, the whole nation of Croatia were watching. And when this Klebertan come, I mean, you can imagine the nerve wracking yes. because of all the hunting problems. And it, in, in that time, they produced 66 chicks. 66 chicks, and every time Klepertan went back to South Africa and would come back, but and every time Milena would be, you know, a bit sad for, well, sad, I don't know, but a bit off for 10 days and then, you know, come back to normal. Um, and it's a beautiful story, but it raised the awareness of not just stalks and you know, about hunting and the whole nation of Croatia, yeah. you know, it really changed uh, the feeling about, you know, um, the plight of migrating birds. So. And so for anyone um, who yeah, is suffering yeah. from eco-anxiety, and, yeah. and it is, as you say, it's a very, it's a very real thing. Yeah. Um, in the process of writing this book, did you find your eco-anxiety uh, went through the roof or did you find some sort of peace? Um, both, both, you know, and I mean, I think the thing about it is, is that we're all, you know, we're all flawed humans with all this stuff and one, you know, I, sometimes, yeah, it is, it's very, very upsetting. I think that's a reality check. There's things, when things go badly wrong, you know, it's very upsetting. But what we found, what we do is... I mean, we used to moan about it a lot. <laughs> you and Jonathan, Me and your Jonathan. Husband, yeah. husband, yeah. Yeah. So we would be moaning about this and that, and they, and and we decided to actually just do something. And we bought some land, and we were lucky enough to be able to buy some land. So we bought some land, and we um, have got this little nature reserve that Jonathan teaches children uh, and young people. Uh, about nature, and they do the John Muir Award, and he has farmers, and they so it it the eco anxiety was cured by just doing stuff, and so we do as much stuff as we can, and that brings you together with people who are also doing things, and you can talk about moths with somebody or talk about and it's just the most fascinating world. I mean, natural world is absolutely fascinating how it all works and clicks together and. Um, so doing stuff means... I mean, and even, as you say, I mean, you know, you were in a lucky position to be able to yeah, buy some afford, land yes, and, um, and to live in an area yeah. where you could. Um, but as you say, you know, as soon as you start thinking, I want to do something, mm. it is amazing. There is a community. There's yeah. a really strong yeah. community And you out don't there. have to have land. You can be a young person. We've got a lot of young you know, budding wannabe ecologists, yeah. and they do stuff, and they volunteer, and they we we know a lot now. We all come together, and we have. There are lots of things that you can just by just doing stuff. Um, and there's and and even with you know we've we've talked a lot about sort of exotic species tonight. You know, and man saving leopards. Yeah. Um, but you did something remarkable in your own garden with sparrows. Oh, the sparrows. I love that yeah, story. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, sparrows that um, I'm lucky enough to live in a place where we can't sleep at all oh, at this yeah. time of year because yeah. the sparrows are so noisy. Yeah. Um, and it really made me laugh when you were going, <laughs> blimey, you know, I've brought these birds back and now I can't sleep either. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. This double edged sword. Yeah, will they ever shut up? Will they ever shut yeah. up? Um, but, you know, sparrows, it was, it was, it was documented. Things like the RSPB Garden Bird Watch, you know, have, have documented the, um, the, the great decline in sparrow numbers. Mm. And yet, you managed to bring them back. Well, it, you know, it was a lot of effort and an awful lot of mealworms. But mm -hmm. I, I did panic. I suddenly panicked because we were down having had 30 sparrows. And suddenly, you know, you don't notice until you do notice. And this, just to be clear, this is in your garden. Yeah. This is at home. This isn't the nature reserve. No, no, no. This is, our, this yeah. is where we live at, in the garden. And... I, you know, I couldn't quite work out what was going on, and they can't really work out what's going on. It can be loads of things. But one of the things, we were down to literally the last two sparrows. And so we put up all these ro uh, roosting nests under the roof because, you know, we used to have much more friendly houses for them to get find little nooks and crannies. 
But one of the problems, I think, was the fact that they weren't getting the right insects at the right time because of climate change or because of spray. You know, yeah. we lived in a sprayed area, but I, didn't, I, don't, I don't know. Um, and so I just put out a lot of mealworms, and I think a lot of it was luck, but we had this last two pair that had three lots of fledged, you know, I think they fledged four, four birds each time, three times. So there were suddenly 14 birds in the garden, whereas we'd only had two. And then next year, of course, you lose some. And then they don't go very far, sparrows. They're very local birds. So you're relying on the gene pool, you know, it's slightly problematic, but there were a couple in the village, and I think, you know, we were, again, lucky. Word went out, there's a load of meal rooms and there was a load of, come round. Yeah, I know, it cost yeah. me a fortune. <laughs> um, but it was the joy of getting the sparrow bush back after four or five years, and suddenly it was just this noisy, you know, what are they saying, what are they, and it's, beep, 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 and it's just, uh, it was the glory of sparrows. It was a wonderful, wonderful thing. But, and you know what's so lovely is when you, when you're telling that story, and indeed many of the stories that you've told us this evening, your joy in the natural world is palpable. And, and that is the thing that we all have to remember, and that is the thing that Beastly reminds us of, is the natural world really is good for us. It's mm. not about us doing it a favor, no. trying to get it back. It's constantly reminding us that yeah. if we just give it a chance, it will give us so much. Yeah. I mean, it's the place that I am, it's the only place I can't meditate. I'm too, you know, but I, the only place I can stop is if I'm watching what the ducks are doing. You know, we've got some ducks in the field in front of us at the moment. She's got six. She had eight the other day, but anyway, she's got six. Um, and but what's going on here, and what the stalks over there, and uh, just the interactions, and I'm suddenly absolutely there for minutes and minutes and minutes and minutes and minutes. And that just, I think it's quite hard for humans to be present. Yeah. And I just find I'm present with other other animals, um, and. And I lose, you know, myself in that. We've had an, an, another question in, which was um, what started at you on your journey with animals. You know, was there one particular encounter that you remember? Um, I, I don't know if there... I think... I, I actually think that my mother probably was a very good person as far as she was very, very good. At, I mean, I can remember her catching a bat in the roof and showing us all, and it was covered in fleas. Don't, don't tell and, that. <laughs> no, this Did was many years ago, <laughs> many, many years ago. And so she was, you know, we lived in the country. I, I watched, I joked about it, I watched Tales of the Riverbank. Yeah. I absolutely yeah. loved Did that. Did you watch Animal Magic as well? No, didn't I? It was oh, tale, I was just completely, it was ratty and the river yes. and the, it was the whole world of it. And I watched animals and I had, you know, I, I, I was always, always interested in always animals. In that. Have we got any questions here in the room? Yes, hello, Jay. Jay. Oh, sorry, I'm back here. Sorry, um, I just want to say thank you. Sorry, apologies. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity, the experience. Um, my question is, um, um, in an attempt to generate um, enthusiasm towards uh, the subject of nature and, and the natural world, um, that is in with consideration towards um, sustainability, um, accountability, and, um, and really within one's own individual capability, um, uh, how important do you think an, an anthropic perspective is um, in triggering and, and catalyzing that motivation? Um, towards that activity um, to align sort of one's self-interest with um, uh, uh, a greater narrative, as it were. And um, how, do you, how does that relate particularly to information and education? And do you think there's too great a, ri a risk of too great a my myopia in that perspective? Um, in, in or do you think, where do you think that balance is uh, in that fascination and trying to generate uh, aligning one's self-interest, I suppose, and, and getting that level of fascination with, with something outside one's own um, ecology, as it, were, uh, as it were. So you're saying what you're saying. I just have to. I'm just going to interrupt what you're saying, and just I just want to say mm. that 
Kate and I met Jay in the, um, I hope you don't mind me saying no, no, this, no, 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 no. down in the exhibition, and he was sketching um, a horse from a, one of the books, and he showed us his sketchbook, and I still cannot believe it. I, Connie, you've got to have a look at the sketchbook. It's unbelievable, and I hope, Jay, you could show, would you, would you show some people the sketchbook? I have never seen anything like it. That's very it completely <laughs> <laughs> blew me away. Both of us. Both of us. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. blew me away. I just want to see. It, made me, it makes me cry even to talk about <laughs> it. It was such an extraordinary piece of work. It just blows me away. So I would like you to show that to people. No, I mean, From somebody who's obviously interested in everything, um, you've got the most extraordinary picture, cat pictures that I've ever seen. I mean, they, re I mean, they, they really, really are. are. You won't. Yeah. They really are, and I, I don't think we should let him go without... <laughs> <laughs> no, you have but to share that. Yeah, I think it's a sharing thing, yeah. that's what you're doing. It's incredible. So I can't remember what question was. <laughs> you asked that question. Well, the, 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 it was, it, I th I'm going to try and encapsulate the question. Um, so part of it was, you know, how you encourage people... Uh, to engage with the natural world if they haven't had uh, experience of it, um, how important education is, um, how important giving people access to the natural world, yeah. is that right? And, and, and how they can therefore feel um, that the natural world sort of belongs to them. Would that, do you think, I've, have I summed that up? Yes, yeah, so I, I, I realise, I mean, when I say anthropic perspective, I mean that is what that is our perspective. That is inherent, um, but it's just um, like where where that balance is between using, I suppose again aligning one's self interest with something that is of a greater narrative and a greater cause, as it were. And, and do you think there's kind of that there's a risk of going too far one way or another in terms of? Or, um, to be honest, I think if you can get. If, if people can feel enthused by the natural world, even in a way that is relatively unnatural, but yeah. is anthropic, as you say, that's no bad thing. Mm. You know, people who haven't grown up in the countryside, uh, who, who, for whom the natural world is an alien world, you need to find a way where they can feel comfortable, feel part of it, um, and... And, and any way you can do that, whether it's through stories, whether it's through art and pictures, whether it's through films, you know, even people might, you know, I mean, this might sound ridiculous, but, um, you know, people watching a film like Bambi, um, you know, that's a Disney film, but actually it had a profound effect on lots of people who watched it in the, when did Bambi come out, 60s, 70s, yeah, 63, 60s? 63, I think. So. Um, it's that sort of that, that potency, isn't it, with symbols and, and imagery and kind of um, a, a, a meta-narrative, as it were, that exactly. can actually... and I think, yeah. you, you know, it, it is about, you know, everything has a part to play in connecting people with the natural world. As I say, it's, it, it, it's visuals, stories, um, sounds. You know, the exhibition downstairs is, is you know, those sounds of the foxes yeah, shrieking and all yeah. those sorts of yeah. things. You know, people hearing a cuckoo, those kind of things, or a skylark for the first time, can be a trigger that makes people feel connected. So I think there are, you know, there are multiple ways um, that... that people can feel part of the natural world. And we need to learn to let the wild in. You yeah, know, we've that... become horribly tidy and... and uh... I'm sorry, just on to that. One of our greatest joys was about three, four, oh, sorry, was about three or four years where we had the joy of having hedgehogs. We've not had them for about two or three yeah. years now at all. I live on a relatively new estate, 35 years or so, but they're now building and building and building everywhere. Yeah. How do we get people to just have hedgehog highways? Yeah. You know, this low, uh, a natural hedging. You know, yeah. how do we get the builders yeah. or the councils to make the builders just do this simple thing? Because yeah. we had everybody come at about quarter to eight every night to see the hedgehogs. Yeah. Every night. Yeah. It was like people would just... Oh, we're coming to see the hedgehogs, and they'd come and stand because we just 
you could look, there is an edu- there's there. a problem about edgy you know people don't know stuff you know yeah. and it's a, it's a, there's a huge gap with you know uh, one of the problems i think is the council the councils seem to have extraordinary amounts of power to do the most unbelievable yeah. amount of damage you know, uh, one of the things that I heard recently on the radio is you need 25% of a population to make some shifts for the for politics, for policies to change. So, you know, it's... It is about being engaged. I mean, there was the story yeah. of, um, and I'm going to say his name wrong, Adam... Vadrak. Vadrak, who is Poland's Attenborough, effectively. Um, and, um, y- you know, he said that the current is it the current president of Poland um, was, had been a hunter and he only got voted in because he stopped hunting and so you know that and that's a small it's a small thing but it's a quite a significant thing that a population actually can make political shift but we just have to be I mean the problem is, again, we're all sitting here, I suspect everyone yeah. here is concerned about the environment, <laughs> concerned about wildlife, concerned about our planet generally, and yet, you know, how many of us voted for a government that would actually do something about that? You know, the problem is we're, we're, scared, we're, we're scared of, is our economy going to be, you know, crash? We want a safe politician. Do we want a green prime minister? Well, we sort of do, but are they going to look after the NHS? Do you know what I mean? We're, we're, but we have to be brave. And ultimately, we are culpable. You know, we can't pass the blame on to everybody else. If we want to make the change, we have to stand up. And do it. I think also the thing about Beasley for me was it's they're not a luxury, yeah. and you know the, polit- the po- politicians make out that they are a luxury and that nature is a luxury and it's it's not a luxury and it's um, I, my my feeling I wanted to get the subject out of its echo chamber so I wanted to tell a story that might appeal to ne- people who are interested in history or interested in you know our planet but um but you know in a more general way um rather than a sort of moth expert or uh, and it's just i wanted to tell the story that it's yeah it's not a luxury it's it's uh, an absolute necessity that we understand our interrelationships with the rest of the planet because we are part of the ecosystem and we need to for a healthy planet and for a, for a future and i find it incredibly frustrating that that message doesn't seem to get home as quickly as it should do. I mean, it's changing, but, you know. Well, if anyone reads this, that message will yeah. start to yeah. get home. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it is half past eight. Um, uh, please say a huge thank you to the remarkable woman that is. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um,